So we're only three rounds of games in and it's Shamrock Rovers and Dundalk already at the top of the table, but Cork City bottom with no goals and no points so far. We have so much to discuss with John Dunleavy, the ex-Cork City player, now it's Sligo Rovers, and we have Dan McDonnell in here as ever for LOI Weekly. How are you, Dan? I'm good, John, not too bad. It, just looking at the table here, it's already nine points Rovers, nine points in Dock. They're cut off and that'll be that the forever. Two horse races confirmed. It's already after Before three Chatham. games. Before, Before Chatham, Chatham, the two horse races is We're is a little bit worried sorted. about the coronavirus. Um, yeah. You know, Cheltenham already doubts that it might go ahead. Is it going to affect football, you think? They're starting to talk about Euro 2020 now. I mean, mm. the one year that UEFA are doing a tournament where you fly all around Europe for the competition. Then you're like, you're talking... Europa League, Champions League. You don't want to be flippant about it now, really. Um, but it is sort of getting to that stage where, I mean, sporting events are now being cancelled. I think Serie A has been called off. It's a, they have to play yeah. them behind closed doors this weekend. So There's so much bad news around the world. I basically just, like, I block it out at this stage mm. because it's just only so much bad news you can take in. But when it starts affecting Cheltenham or... That's sports what's getting events. really personal for like, you now. Well, yeah. I'm a, I live in the first world. All of a sudden, I get really animated about it. Like, we need to deal with this, you know. Mm. Whereas I've had a friend from Iran telling me, like, we've been locked up in the house for a week. We actually can't leave because people have died there. But I'm worried about Cheltenham. You're like, I've got a couple of good anti-post bets. I, mean, I you, actually you, You've do. got your problems. So the anti-post yeah. bets could be rendered redundant. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that wouldn't be good at well, all. They probably get a refund, whereas the people in Iran won't get those weeks they spent and in their house And they're not betting back. on Cheltenham. No, no, to be fair, they're not. So You've seen yeah. a lot of football over the last I have, weeks. yeah. I was at Derry, Derry Finn yeah. Harps on Friday and then, um, yeah, then Monday I was up in Dundalk and Cork. Actually, really? like, you sounded very downbeat on the old tweet machine. It was like, oh, I? this game is... Oh, that, yeah. Dundalk Cork was a nonsense of a match. Yeah. Nonsense of a match. Like, I think after like five, five, five to ten minutes, it was like, oh, this is... It doesn't this look is, beautiful, This is sort of a training match. Like D Dan has been uh, in unbelievable form with his headlines for um, for a long time now. Um, and Cork's Clue is just the latest one, really. I, I don't know if I could tell the Frankie goes to Hall. No, no, it's... it's can't it's, really tell it's that very, one. It's very yeah. hard to tell that story now. It shouldn't yeah. even lead to it. Um, um, a Cork's friend Clued. of mine, basically, uh, she... Let's call her a friend, right? So, essentially, she recently uh, became pregnant. And I was saying, oh, Frankie's pregnant. To which Dan said, Frankie goes to Hollis Street. Which I thought was great. That was it. it was yeah. very, very good. Probably had to be there at the time. Cork's crew but, uh, was right up there as Cork's well. Imagine well, we the live studio audience and <laughs> be bursting themselves laughing at that. Yeah, or, the, Frankie we, goes or to we canned laughter that we would actually yeah. add after uh, the fact. But Cork yeah, or Well, you see, it's not even, I mean, again, we're sort of, like, it's a sort of a lighthearted tone about that, but actually just a real serious discussion about how bad things are at Cork. How close were they to going? Well, it does the seem they were a couple hours away from being in Boller, and... Like, I almost think that this story probably hasn't got as much traction as as you might Wouldn't think it would, be, it would it would deserve. And I wonder, is this a classic Dublin media thing that had it been a, a Shamrock Rovers a couple hours away from like real bother, would it be would it be a bigger tale? And maybe Does that photo of Finney there almost uh, encapsulates uh, what challenge he's faced with at the moment. Like, <laughs> and what's it's kind of like holy crap! What have yeah. I got myself in for? I left Longford. Um, for a big job, and now it's like, well, this is a big, big job, but not in the way I thought. But he, like, he was actually quite upbeat on Monday. I think he has to be. I mean, I, I, like, I have a bit of sympathy for him in the in the sense that, as much as he says he knew it was a tough job, uh, I'm not sure if people necessarily knew the extent to which how difficult it has become. I mean, they were poor on Monday. I know that they're, green they're trying to take positivity from it. Well, in, in I, fairness, though, against Rovers, so they got battered by Rovers, but they actually had two very good chances at nil all. Um, and I would give some... They're playing against Rovers, they're kind of... They have no chance. But they did create chances. But you're, I think I, you're clutching at a small bit. Now, I, mm. I, I know what you're saying. They face... Rovers and Dundalk are going to batter They face anyway. Rovers and Dundalk. But I, what I would say about Cork's situation, I watched Finn Harps on Friday who had a bit of a plan, players who know the league, like Barry McNamee is there, even his brother Tony. You look throughout Dave Webster. They have a bit of know-how and they know the job at hand. You watch Cork and like on Monday... And we and just have like worried, a lot of players, worried pictures of Neil Finn but, for the rest of the show. But a, there's a lot of players yeah. there who are new to the league and you can't necessarily trust them to be as consistent. They might have maybe more ability than some, you know, because they have good pedigree and good background. But this is not. Point, this is not the. It's the, not a this, learning the, time. Yeah, exactly. It can be, and they play Finn And you have a coach who's only learning as well. And like they play Finn Harps on Friday, and I just from what I've, I've saw Finn Harps on Friday, and I saw 
Cork City on Monday and Harps are ahead of them at this point and maybe over time you know you know Cork have still for all their resource issues they still have a better resources than Finn Harps mm. and they are training together every day they can build an understanding but the broader picture here to me is a more worrying one for the league and the questions that it faces because we probably would have I mean Cork won the club of the year at the uh, Electricity League Awards last year How did they and, go from challenging in Europe to nearly being but I'll just finish my point that like two, like two three years ago we would have spoke about Cork as being like a uh, well, this is a fan run club you know they've, they've, they've risen up from the ashes uh, best supporter club in the league um, this is working they're in Europe every year but clearly the reality of what was going on was very different and they've made big budgetary mistakes the only thing the in, in their defence like so people have sort of taken this as a means to kind of slag the fan run club ethos this will happen where there's a lack of prudency at, at any club potentially there was just a spectacular mismanagement in terms of budgets there was a mistake but I don't think you should kind of use it as a way of saying all oh, fan run clubs. I think work. actually, I, I'm not so sure. I right. think I think it's a problem for like, see, there's there's a the fan run model is fantastic, but and like in theory, it's what you would like, but. Like how, 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 how does it operate? Money. How does it operate? Well, no, I'm just saying that how does it operate mm. that, um, for example, Shamrock Rovers have one at the moment, but they don't really like they have a fifty percent one, so they have the fan ownership, the involvement, the sense of attachment, but they also had private investment, a substantial private investment, which is carrying them along. My concerns with say fan ownership and other clubs in the league would be that they wouldn't have the fan base of Cork, so they wouldn't necessarily be able to match it. Whereas Cork, it seems within their fan run model, they couldn't attract the business and commercial support from the city to back it up. And where the league is at at the moment, and in fact where football is at generally, and you look at football across in like the lower leagues in England, clubs are massively reliant on benefactors and you know people who are supporting them. And Cork are now in a dilemma where Trevor Hemmings is now looking at, you know, he clearly wants to to take over to some degree. And they're in a dilemma yeah. because how are they going to... Like people, there's, there's always this assumption that the clubs at the top are going to come back to you. Um, that, like, in this league where you don't have a TV deal, where you don't have, um, you know, massive guaranteed streams of revenue, it's a massive dilemma because you, like, you, where, where is the money? It's by being at the top. How do you get to the top? Well, they don't have the money to get there unless they have some kind of investor coming in to support them. And people just assume, well, the, you know, the dog are going to go away, you know, they're, they're, those people are going to leave or, you know, Rovers are, you know, will hit some difficulty. I'm not so sure that all of those things will occur within the next three, four, five years. And for a club like Cork, they have to now open their... You know, open their horizons a bit, and at least strongly consider. It. I know they don't want to relinquish it from where they were before, um, but it, it might be something they look at. It's, if you have twenty thousand, twenty-five thousand fans, like some fan-run models in Scandinavia and Europe or whatever, then maybe. Yeah. But when you have a league with, with very limited sponsorship and TV deals and stuff, it's actually very hard. We're I running out of time, and we model. do need to get to Galway Rising at some stage. Well, it we doesn't won't. happen this yeah. week. It'll never happen. But uh, we do have GB Golden Boot Grainberg five well, this goals, is, this over five thousand people in Tala. Terrible defended by Cork. This is Cork themed um, again. But yeah. Grainberg, he's he's obviously staking a claim here. Five goals, first for over his player since the sixties. I think or thereabouts. Yeah, I mean it's 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 an incredible haul. Now he, he does seem to have picked up an injury, which is a slight problem. But Looks like he's out enough. Last year, like it was, actually, it was actually a very low scoring year for strikers in the league. I mean, Junior ended up top of the charts with I think maybe 14, 15 goals. You know, it was actually you know, that whole thing about a 20 goal a season striker just didn't exist last year. The Hubenator year. has a couple after his penalty. Yeah, on, and he he did a lot of great work outside the box last year and, and the couple of times I've watched on Doc again. I'm not so sure he's going to have as prolific a year because he's doing a lot of work in other areas of the pitch and not What's so much celebration around the box. This is the Hoobinator is in the Terminator. Oh, okay, type thing. Yeah. 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 So he does that after every goal. Yeah. You should have possibly figured it out by now. He scored about should 70 have. goals in the last couple of years. Yeah, but, only um, seven from play last season and but, six, but he's, he's, he's off the mark. Quickly. But it does show the difference that, like, if you if you can unearth a striker when the figures were so low last year, the difference they could make. And and then Rovers have also signed Rory Gaffney now. Um, I think we might talk about him a bit later on, but you know he's come into the equation and it's possible that that firepower that they have um, could have been a difference this year, could have been them a bit closer, because you forget that Burke wasn't there for most of last season and he did actually score some big goals in the run-in. And we did reference it at the top as well. The first two have predictably um, staked their claim. Um, and Friday is going to be good. And Friday's going to be interesting. Mm. I think the thing about Dundalk is that they haven't really gotten going yet. And they actually have quite a few players injured, strangely, at the moment in midfield areas. So Rovers will go into this game, granted Burke is out, Rovers will go in probably more at full strength than Dundalk, which might be pivotal. Well, it's yeah. a big game for Rovers. It's massive. Well,
well, see, I don't know. Like sometimes this game, and I, I spoke to Chris Shields about it the other day. Like the, the clubs played each other at the start of last season, or you know, similar round of fixtures last year, and it's a shadow boxing game. It, it was, was nil all, and it's cagey. And sometimes I think that these early season games, it's dangerous to put too much meaning into them if it's later in the season. Now I still think, you know, I hope it's a fantastic occasion. I hope the win stays away because that's been ruining games, including Derry last week, because Tala can get pretty exposed to that. But you, you think there's a possibility that you should have close to a full house uh, you have the two best teams in the country and if they can't deliver some kind of spectacle like you'd be pretty downbeat and it, I think it's nicely poised where Grover's probably have a bit more I mean, they scored six last week and there's a, maybe a small bit more excitement about them but the flip side of that is like Dundalk I think against Shells they, they struggled a bit and they had moments against Derry but what they, about the kid but, Flores by the way what a oh, strike some strike great backdrop some strike yeah. no a horrible backdrop horrible backdrop a, a goal that should be going viral now arguably my favourite goal outside of the foot half volley what more do you want Unbelievable! Mm -hmm. I've been saying this lad needs more game time because he can play. It's exceptional. And this is going to be, but like this is game on Friday is only part of a massive double header with um, Streets of Rage the second or whatever they're called playing Galway United <laughs> Streets on of Saturday. Rage. Yeah, the development team, Street Fighter Two, development team as they were called. And mm. I think the, what's that about? The, Longford Town seemingly chose not to put the name of the club they were playing on the match program yeah. cover. And sometimes you know, sometimes there's no such thing as bad publicity if people are talking about what you're doing. But sometimes there is. Sometimes just you uh, you confirm a lot of suspicions or uh, negative views that exist about uh, the first division. I think, as I said before, they had a point. In Should be Brandon about Kavanaugh them. was actually playing. Yeah, they, is... they had they had a they had a point about um, you know the, the the process of how it happened. But once you're there, like concentrate on promoting your own team. And, and your but own also division. respect the players and the opposition. These are young players yeah. who deserve respect. They're playing their first game for Shamrock Rovers, a second or whatever they're called. And it's like I I, I find well, they it got the, I think it got the derision it probably deserved. And I mean. Again, find reasons to talk about Longford and Drada and those clubs. They've they've stuff to advertise them, not sort of these stupid jibes which really say more about them than they do, but say more about Shamrock Rovers too, in my view. After the break, we only have JD in the house, John Dunleavy. And you're welcome back to part two. We now have Johnny Dunleavy in studio. Uh, there are only two teams actually at the bottom with no points so far. Cork City, who Johnny Dunleavy left, uh, and Sligo Rovers, who he joined. You left one sinking ship and you uh, joined another, did you? Oh, only one you, of them. That's who you want to put it, Johnny. Uh, uh, no, in fairness to, I, I suppose it's been a bit more nuanced with Sligo. Yeah, You've had no, some tough I, games. <coughs> How are you, by the absolutely. way? Absolutely. Very well, good yeah. Good to be back. Good, good to see you. Yeah. I was up with your preview night last night there. It was, uh, Did you enjoy it? Johnny's Cheltenham preview night. It was good. Nice. Johnny's yeah. Cheltenham preview Sam night. Sam yeah. We're discussing uh, maybe Cheltenham if, if, we, if we could go, but the, as we're saying with Dan, you, you never know with the virus. Yeah, it's not uh, looking good at the moment. Um, How's it looking in Sligo? Listen, we've had a tough start, no question about it. Um, the first three games... Even though even though we've been beaten in the first three games, um, I'm actually quite positive on it. To be fair, the the game, especially in Daily Mount the other night, we changed around a few things formationally. Probably, um, we brought in a new left back, Alex Cooper, who I think no, I haven't seen much of him, but I think he's very he's going to be very impressive. Um, he played I, for a team called Fresno or something like that. Yeah, he played for a team yeah. called Fresno. They were a franchise that actually, as far as I know, they got moved maybe because they had no stadium. And because Fresno was in my head, I was like, is that? What is Fresno? Is it like some sort of food or something? Like it rang a bell. Anyway. Yeah, I don't, they're no more. They're no more. Well, they're co they're going to be coming back again next year, let's say. Right. Um, but he had to find a team in the meantime, so the manager took him. But yeah, frustrating start I think for us really. The first game from Park, the same. It was there was very little in the game. And, um, and for this your manager, he's he's some scouting repertoire because he he gets like these players from literally players from all here, over here, there, and everywhere. A guy who walks a cat, yeah. you know, every day. Chris Twardy, he got him last season. Yeah, um, Archie, 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 Archie the cat. Team with his Timu Instagram. with his very colourful Instagram pictures mm, of like man. around Strand. Johnny John <laughs> Levy, you know, <laughs> spreads far and wide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. far and wide. Now, I have to say the the boys that have come in are good characters as well. They've uh, they've added to the dressing room now. Team who's a team who's a great fella. Actually, you want to the size of him. He is a big man. Six five, yeah. Six five, mm -hmm. but he's built like a tank as well. He's like a Must Viking. Must be very active Viking WhatsApp group of players coming in and out all the time. It's like yeah, this man has left and this man has come uh, in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Regular Romeo, Romeo was yeah. gone. <laughs> Romeo was gone. Might be back. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, I wanted to actually bring up uh, John Mann because he got injured pre-season. Yeah. Um, I, I, I felt, I just felt a bit uneasy about this. He was. 
uh, the, the subject of a bad tackle in the pre-season game against that loan, but it effectively ruled him out for around about four months. And uh, yeah. I saw the, the tackle back and I just thought it was it was a tackle that maybe wasn't necessary in a pre-season game. But what was the feeling in Sligo? Uh, possibly. I, I was at the game and I was watching it from a height, kind of. And I have to say, when the tackle went in first, I didn't really think too much of it. And But obviously, immediately it, it looked bad and you could hear John was very so... You know, he was crying and different things like that. And it turned out to be a broken leg, unfortunately. And, Listen, the good thing probably for him is it's, you know, it's an undisplaced fracture. It's something that will heal well, especially for a fellow of his age. And I have to say, you know, the ability that he has, I hope he comes back, you know, as good or not, if not better. Like, uh, How's your own injury situation? It's always a, it's a problem for you. Every yeah, now and then. For, unfortunately, if I was a horse, we put down long ago. Mm. But, uh, yeah, no. You would have gotten uh, the bullet, which is I suppose, one of your earlier yeah, That was uh, one of my earlier quotes, terms, was it? Yeah, mm. you still don't know if it was a euphemism or not. Uh, but, uh, yeah, look, it's it's not easy for me, I suppose. I, I take probably longer between matches to recover and things like that, just more as a result of the surgeries than anything else. But we're managing as best we can, and um, the manager, the medical staff, you know, everyone has been great to me in Sligo as well, so um, hopefully it's something we can manage going mm. forward. Like, I appreciate you have your own injury history, but yeah. as a player generally, all of a sudden, like you have this long off season, and then you're into like Friday, Monday, Friday. Is mm. it? Is it? How is it for the body generally? I mean, I said you have your own issues, but like, it's a tough one. Like, you see a lot of early season injuries now, and I sometimes wonder is it schedule related? Yeah, I'm not sure myself. I think the fixture schedule in the league is a bit of a farce anyway, and it's something that we, it's something that was mentioned maybe three years ago, and something that we really haven't dealt with. The build up of games in April, there might be something like ten or eleven matches in April, mm. and I think that's just nonsense when you. If you look later on in the season, I think there's a period maybe in August where we haven't got a home game for five weeks. It's to do with the FBI uh, Cup and how that's spaced. If you get knocked out of Cup early, then mm. you're in bother. But you, you've all, you also have that this year as well, generally. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, no, I do understand that. And, and I understand there's probably... But there has to be a, a happy medium that we can find somewhere. Mm. You know, yeah, Shamrock Rovers like resting six players, I think, the other night. Five or six players for the trip to Watford. It's difficult. If you take a team that... Say ourselves, we probably have a relatively tight squad. You know, the, the more times we can play the same team, I would say... Maybe it's the same for every team, but the manager would say the more times you can play the same team, the better. So when you have that build-up of fixtures and that, you know, that real that real pile, you can't do much training in between. You're just going from game to game. If you get a few injuries, all of a sudden you're very stretched. And um, I think it's something we need to look at. I think it's an issue that the leadership is actually needed on because this is one of the. And not to go back to the the development team thing, but one of the discussions around that time was. Well, you know, it's a decision that all 19 clubs in the league should have had a vote on it. If all 19 clubs in the league had a vote on the length of the season, they would probably keep it. The, 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 the democratic majority would be to keep it yeah. the length that it is because clubs want to keep paying, you know, 38, 40, 42 week contracts. That's the real reason the season is as congested as it is. I know the FBI could do it better. You could talk about the, the summer break and, you know, some players want that, some don't. Mm. Uh, you can talk about the structure and the spacing of various things, the size of the league. But fundamentally, Mentally, it comes down to the fact that the majority of clubs want to pay their players for as few weeks as possible. And that is one of these things where actually you don't need the majority vote and preference on this decision. You need a strong leadership strong from the leadership, top to yeah. say, if we are a professional league, this is what we're going to do. And you have to sort out your budget accordingly. That's what should happen. Uh, whether it will happen, well, we'll see. Yeah, we're mm -hmm. going to talk a bit more Cork City uh, with JD in the third part of the show because he was obviously at the club uh, during its peak times over the last few years. But what have you made of the league so far? Um, it's been Rovers and Dundalk kind of shooting up to the front. Is it going to stay like that, do you think? Yeah, I'd be very surprised if there's if there's any change in that. Um, I think the two of them have looked very impressive so far. I know I, I heard you in the first part there talking that you know Rovers obviously scored their six. Let's say going into Friday night, Rovers scored their six last week. But Dundalk will take a lot of heart from going to somewhere like Shelburne, a packed Talker Park, and you know grinding out results as well. It's it's what they do. It's what they do so well. They've got players there that are just used to winning, and I, I think that means a lot. Um, really looking forward to seeing the game on Friday night. I think it'll be it'll be a good test for both teams now. It'll be interesting, and, and I hope it's a good advert for the league as well. I suppose the worry for Sligo is that you just your lack of goals is going to be a question mark for a lot of teams pre-season, but it has been borne out so far for Sligo. Is it something that you're uh, continually working on? It's something we're working on every week and working in training and like the quality that we have there, I think it is something that will turn. Um, you know, you look at the likes of Ronan Coughlin, the likes of Ronan Murray, um, there could be some movement maybe and more players coming in. Whether you brought you know, in a striker from New Zealand now, New Zealand international. He's probably not in your not WhatsApp group yet. So he hasn't he hasn't yet. Yet. No, I haven't yet. Once he has a in Italy, he'll be all right. <laughs> That's it, exactly. But, um, you yeah. know, it's, uh, like, yeah, look, but it's, a, it's an evolving stage of the season. Like, this is the problem that you face. You're probably still getting to know some of these characters and personalities. Yeah, in some ways, 
we are. We've you have your own kept... gaff, though. You live in your own. You've like, you've I just, do, yeah. just been given this kind of um, conversation. Except, except stable. When, you, when you come bunking in well, there. Well, every now and then. Every now and then. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Two bed house all to himself. Next yeah. to the ground yeah. as well, apparently. Very yeah, close. Yeah. Yeah, it's Converted location. horse stables. Yeah, no, I have yeah. to say, no, Sligo itself is. Uh, Great town. I really yeah. like it there, and I have to say. Love the town and love the. I'd say it's very underrated as a sort of a destination, you know, the the coastline and places to see, places to eat. It's a really lovely part of the world. Waterford United coming up is a Waterford big game. FC. Waterford FC. Waterford FC, rather, is a big game already. And, mm. you know, Waterford obviously started well against St. Patrick's, but have uh, faced a couple of difficult games since and wobbled at home to Bowes. And Shamrock Rovers, kind of disappointing that the Shamrock Rovers on a Monday night could be in a big crowd down there. But um, this is a big game. Yeah, it's a big game. And I think it's, we're excited for it as well. Um, you know, as I say, last week against Bowes, in general play, I thought we were very good. I thought there were parts of the game where we were really good, our passing, our possession, on, on a surface that was difficult for both teams. I have no doubt that Bowes would say the same. Um, so, no, I think it's it's a, it's a good opportunity for us at the weekend. Probably we might have a couple more players maybe back from injury as well. And um, Look, I can see the green shoots. I, I'm, I'm very positive still about the season. We're three games into a 36-game season. It's certainly no time to panic. Obviously, you're from Bally Buffet. You played for Cork City. Cork City, Finn Harps, all of a sudden, is the making of the second biggest game of the weekend. Yeah, another big game as well. Uh, Harps obviously started very well, taking. They, 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 it was said to Ollie Horgan on Highland Radio, what a start, Ollie. You know, you've four <laughs> points, could have had six, could have had none. <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's, he's a character, all right. I remember him talking a few years ago about. Uh, they were, t they were in the mid-table and they were after winning maybe, you know, five out of seven games or something. They are aiming for Europe, Ollie, and he said, the closest we'll be getting to Europe is a plane to Lourdes. Yeah. You know, yeah. this sort of what stuff. And that's a famous quote, so. Big game um, for Cork City. Big game for Cork City as well. It's been a, a tough start to the season for them. And I think it's part to emphasise for them as well. They've played the two best teams in, in the league at this stage, and that, that was always going to be a difficult start for them. So um, it's, it's certainly not a time for them to get too concerned either, albeit they've conceded a few goals. And, um, you know, I think they have a lot of good players down there still. Can you believe the turnover, though? I mean, Garrett Morrissey the other night was the only, like, he started. I know McNulty's on the bench and Alan Bennett's still around the place, but yeah. Morrissey was the only starter who was involved in the Cork and Dock games that you were involved involved in and you were there two seasons ago could you have imagined this quickly that all of those lads could be gone basically that group that you were that group that you were with I suppose I don't think anyone could have foreseen it really you know for for everyone to be gone I think the time that I left look it was my time to go I think anyway I was fairly content with the decision and I needed a change and, and all of the things that went with it but um, a lot of boys kind of left around the same time and then Last year, I suppose, just things started to unravel a little bit. And, I mean, listen, us as players, we have no idea what's going on behind the you scenes. You have no clue that, about finances so, or what's going on. We have no idea about finances, mm -hmm. no idea about budgets at the end of the day. It's not something that's part of our remit. Um, but it's certainly come to the fore recently. And, um, you know, to have to sell the sell-on clauses for the two lads down there, I, I have no doubt it was a difficult decision for them. Mm -hmm. But if it was one that had to be made, then... For the you know for the continual run in the club, let's say they had to do it. It's Derry Bowes, uh, obviously Shamrock Rovers, Dundalk, uh, Shelburne, Pats. Briefly before we get to it uh, in further depth later on, um, Rovers Dundalk, what an brilliant. absolute belter! Yeah, brilliant game. Pro two proper teams. How do you call it? Um, as I say, there. Winning's a, winning's a habit. I think Rovers winning the cup last year now will certainly have an effect on them. Will galvanise them this season. They know they can do it now. Um, but I just. Dundalk have, Dundalk have lads that have been there and done it year in and year out and they still won the league by a good number of points last year it'll be interesting to see how if Rovers can continue scoring the goals that they've been scoring and if Rory Gaffney comes in and, mm. and continues scoring goals for them so um, yeah looking forward to the game I can see it being a cagey affair to start the season anyway I, I don't see I don't see it being too high scoring or anything what are you thinking? yeah like I think you mentioned the, the players that Rovers rested but I mean the Dundalk also didn't include Massey on Monday Boyle mm. Uh, Slogger come off the bench so they'll be rotating in it as well I just think that there's every chance they'll cancel each other out hopefully in an entertaining sort of manner um, but uh, I, I sort of I'm leaning towards a draw but I do think yeah like it's still a very similar core to that on dock side they're not suddenly just going to change their personality overnight and uh and they they like Tala. Actually, you know, Tala suits them. They have a great record there, so I don't think they'll have any fears going there at all. Thanks very much, lads. And just before we go on Air Sport One, we kick off our live coverage next week. Our cameras will be in Dailymount Park on Friday, March 6th for Bows against Shells in a Dublin derby. And the following night, we will bring you JD's Sligo Rovers against Table Toppers Shamrock Rovers from the showgrounds. On Friday, March the 13th, we will be at the home of the champions to see Dundalk against St. Pat's, Stephen O'Donnell returning to Oriel Park. All games are live on Air Sport One. 
Thanks very much for watching this week and do stay tuned uh, for the third part of the show if you're listening on the podcast or watching on YouTube. So it's part three for our podcast listeners and YouTube viewers. We mentioned JD went from Cork City to Sligo Rovers earlier on. Gary Buckley did the exact same thing. And Gary Buckley was actually at the centre of one of my favourite LOI-related kind of banter stories. But it's actually more than banter. It's quite funny. You were in Vegas with uh, Bucks, as he's more affectionately known. Yeah, we were in Vegas. There was about 10 of us in Vegas. And uh, one of the days, the tallest building in Vegas, I can't remember the name of it, but there's a sort of a rotating restaurant at the top of it. So What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Except mo most for, of it, except for the yeah. story, let's say. And... Uh, so we all, there was a lift up and six or seven of us jumped into the lift along with this English couple and there was a girl working in the lift as well. So we all jumped in anyway. We were all just talking to each other and the next thing, Bucks just turns around to your one that was working in it. He says, well, how's business? Up and down. <laughs> <laughs> so we're all in stitches. The English couple are looking at us like we have two heads and yeah, just really, no, that's, have, I mean, that's just it. not funny. Like, with respect. It reminds you know? <laughs> of that Simpsons episode where, you know, it's like uh, they go to H&M Scratch and whatever. It's New Year's Eve every day and Marge is like, it must be wonderful to bring in the New Year every day and your man is like, please kill me. <laughs> She's probably thinking like that one. Um, a car going up or down though. That's, well, that that's our the, first that is uh, the question here. This is know? the fans' questions. Uh, God, we have to like mingle with the fans for, for this uh, part of the show. This one is from Dylan uh, on Instagram. What do Cork have to do to turn it around? Now, we, we don't have three hours to even begin. They also have the answers to the financial uh, questions no. that they're going to face, which is the problem. And they, I mean, they have to decide what to do. Now. I, 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 just, I do problem. slightly disagree with what you're saying there. It, anyone could make this mistake. People can overstretch. And whatever it was, they thought that their crowd was going to be a lot bigger. Johnny, they season. got 800 grand from getting into the Champions League. Mm. 850 grand, like that's proper, like a proper prize fund. In addition to qualifying for Europe consecutively for a couple of seasons. Um, How did and, they spend it? And well, I mean, they, 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 they had an expanded squad as well. And I, I don't have the answers to all the, I don't have the access to the books, but I'm just saying that I, I think you have to be pretty harsh on the mistakes that were made because, or, or else, then what, like what is the, like where is the league going if a team that generated the second most income I mean, realistically, if you were to look at sort of, if you were to draw a chart of money made from Europe and whatever it might be, uh, they would have no doubt been the second most successful, but the biggest crowds in the league, and they're in bother. So it's either like bad mistakes have been made or the thing just doesn't work. So like, there's no real happy answer to that, to this sort of d debate. Well, I, I thought your squad was too big, but that's, I'm not blaming the management because the management's going to spend what, he, what they have. But your squad seemed very big and obviously Cork overstretched. They must have spent too much on players they didn't necessarily need or something went badly wrong anyway that it came to this. Well, the squad that we had when I was there, I, I certainly wouldn't have said it was too big. Um, and it's it's very difficult. I don't think you can blame, you know, you, you couldn't blame a manager, for example, for that because, like, he's going to spend the budget that he's given. Now, as I say, we have no idea about the ins and outs of the finance and that in the background. Um, and we had no idea of the, let's say, predicament that the club was potentially going to be in so mm. it's um it's a very tough tough situation for them at the moment and i know there'll be a lot of people hurting down there particularly you know given it is a fan run club mm. second one in from c dot dinny the real c dinny uh will finn Harris. as opposed to the fake c dinny <laughs> <who> <laughs> obviously is the bane of his life on social <laughs> media. Dinny. he's a finn Harris fan you might know him it's a real is he a finn Harris fan c dinny yeah. it's a real dinny no, I, think, I, think the, I think the picture of his crest is might be a car oh, crest, it's actually. a finn Harris related question so maybe maybe he isn't actually will finn Harris maintain the current press form over the course of the season ollie horgan would obviously say no and what should their targets for the season be i would i would argue should be to stay up well, that would have been their first target, anyway. I have no doubt. And I can't see them getting relegated, honestly. And I certainly, don't. if you'd have asked Ollie at the start of the year, that would have been mm. that would have been his answer. But um, beating your hand off for a playoff. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but you look at his if you look at his recruitment and stuff, and the players that he's brought in. I think I heard Dan say it earlier as well. It's it's seasoned League of Ireland players and and very talented players as well. Um, from what I heard, they were actually unlucky to draw. Yeah, Derry didn't see the game. On, on that were, time, what did you mean the way they were set up? Because they seemed. I only saw. I think the first half. Uh, I was at the. I was at the races. I only half watch it but they seem to really kind of suppress what Derry well, you know, was trying to they do. They set up a three at the back and then they, they had wing backs. One of the wing backs like it was Webster, Mark Russell, the other one. So like they're actually quite um 
you know, very solid. And I think Derry were, were, were actually pretty frustrated and Declan Devine was saying afterwards that they're playing against wing-backs and actually they didn't really, Derry didn't play with any width. They, they actually could have like got in behind and caused harps and problems and they didn't and Derry were very safe and sort of, you know, they, they, they played into their hands a small bit and didn't really, and it was actually Stephen Mallon come on for Derry as a sub in the second half as a, a winger who I think is going to be, he's on loan from Sheffield United and I think following the sort of Parkhouse success, I think Mallon on the evidence of this will do well and for Gary, great skill. But mm -hmm. this is the point, like Harps already know what they are at the start of the season. They have a sort of an identity and a structure and this is why you can't be too, uh, and even I'm, I know Johnny's obviously f hopeful, very hopeful that Sligo Rovers are going to turn it around. But would you have teams that are still trying to figure out and you know identify players? And I think I'd just be a bit more worried about Cork than, than I thought I would be, having seen them, that like this is a tough league to suddenly just learn as you go along. And I think Harps have a very good chance. I think Friday would be interesting because Harps will get in there with a firm game plan and know what they're going to do. And are mm. Cork going to be good enough to... To play under the pressure of, of unlocking that. I mean, they what'll the crowd be? What'll the crowd be like actually? Turner's Cross for that game. Will they be like backing a young team, a young management team, cognizant of what's been going on, or will they be getting on their back like some Dundalk fans were absurdly on Monday, kind of moaning in the first half because they were only one or two nil up. Whatever. Well, just, I think it was just because the game yeah. was just an non-event as well. Yeah, but that was right. that's part of the problem. But, yeah. but I mean, compared to Dundalk fans, sort of moaning a bit to Cork City fans, who are definitely staring the possibility of relegation. How will they treat the young players? You think on Friday? I'm, I'm Sure, it'll be a mixture. Um, mm. I, I know, like, let's say my first two years down in Cork, we had a, we had a couple of tough times and the crowd started to dwindle and you know they would have been getting on our back a little bit and it's really just because they want you to do well and then conversely obviously when we were doing well you know Turner's Cross was a fortress um, it's, it's hard for the young players in the situation that they're in as well to you know it is a lot of pressure on their back to, to come from that and to pick up results against teams like Harps and you know Friday night's going to be a very difficult one for them. Given your history of injuries, which has been very difficult, I want your opinion yeah. on this particularly. Um, euphemistic. Yeah, there. absolutely. Paul Hogan, um, should there be a further drive towards AstroTurf pitches in the Please league, similar no. to the Please lower no. league? Yeah. Okay, so my ask you to this is, I'm not a fan of Astro, but yeah. we have a lot of cancellations and we have climate change. From a business point of view? Yes. If you're going to look at this purely from a business point of view, absolutely AstroTurf is the way to go. If you're going to look at it from a physical player welfare point of view, I don't know the stats on it, uh, but I would certainly argue that, it, well, if you asked the players in the League of Ireland today, would they rather play on grass or AstroTurf, including the Dundalk players and let's say Derry players probably that play oh, on yeah, it at course, home every yeah. two weeks, they want to play on grass. But, they, but this is the thing, they don't actually, how long term studies have been done to figure out what the you know, effects of this are longer term because it can't it can't have been that extensive. Well, they, yeah, but I think they know how their body feels as well. Yeah. I mean, they, like, the chocolate lads coming down the stairs the next day and they're like absolutely the crap. Like, and it's, listen, the flip side of that is, I mean, there are players who've been at the dog for six, seven seasons, like absolutely. Massey and Shields yeah. and people like that who are showing no ill effects as time goes on, but. Um, it's a, it is a difficult one. It goes back to the classic small league um, syndrome, and you know, like if if you're reliant on like a lot of council run pitches, and so clubs don't even necessarily have control or the finances to look after their pitch maintenance, and like you have a situation where like games are being called off in, in the early weeks. We've spoken earlier about the fixture madness that cr mm. that is that exists at the moment. Now again, you're talking about like a, it's a solution. Like it's it's not two wrongs making a right in any respects here, but like if you have a a, a narrow league season, then you, you don't need games called off on top of that. Now, I, I, my point is that the season should be longer anyway, so you yeah. should be able to absorb that. But it's, a, it's an, like between the wind and the pitches, like it's a, it's a tough start of the season in terms of that and the elements and the impact it can have. But the trade off for that is the summer football, the benefits that can have for mm. Europe. And hopefully, like again, if we were a massively wealthy league with loads of resources, then you might not even necessarily even need to be playing a summer season. You could have, you know, you wouldn't be in that situation. But we are where we are for a reason. So, I can understand why the debate is there. I mean, the new daily event is going to be astroturf. I mean, I've, I don't know what the dairy one is like. I've never heard as much complaints about the dairy one mm. as I have about the the dock one. Well, it's you, quite new. You got to hope that the the actual technology is evolving. Mm. I mean, the first and Dawkins was a farce, you mm. know, and you've seen bad they get worse. pitches. They get there, worse. there are good ones out there. Yeah, oh no, undoubtedly you there know. are good ones. And the Derry one is probably an example of a good one, let's say, even the stadium itself, you know, it's a mm. really lovely place but to they play football. They regress, the like, that's the point, they do regress quite badly after time, like so. They probably can do, yeah. but I assume that the newer ones are probably, mm. you know, better able to handle it. Um, I suppose I should mention the names, uh, Patrick Hoobin, Aaron Connolly, 
Rory Gaffney, the latest Galwegian, um, very good striker, not to play for Galway United at any stage of his career. And it looks maybe more or less likely now, but he signed for Shamrock Rovers. Dan Mohan, do you think the signing of Gaffney for Rovers, the final piece of the puzzle, will it finally see them dethrone Dundalk? It looks a good signing, Dan, the face of it. I haven't seen him play in years now, but he's <laughs> yeah, 30 I mean, now. It is a good signing. The one thing I would say is that he's had a difficult 18 months or so. Like he, like he had a very interesting career arc in England that he, he climbed his way up to League 1 level at Bristol Rovers, played a big part in them getting promoted from League 2, having gone to England actually quite late uh, compared to others. Last he went to Salford. Now it's very hard. I mean, a lot of players went to Salford. You know, maybe just to see Manchester, or maybe it was just because it was bloody good deals on offer. I mean, I think we can sort of not good deals figure it out. Or Aldi but either. they've uh, they've they've climbed their way up. And the last year, you know, Walt Sawley was on loan. wasn't didn't seem to be popular there. Struggled with his form a bit. So, yeah, on his ability, it looks like a great signing. But he's clearly got to get it back to himself a small bit from where he's been. Now, again, like it can be very difficult in the lower leagues in England for someone to get stuck in a rut and it's hard to snap out of it. And then they come home to familiar territory and they take flight. Look, I mean, you would have looked at Pat Hooban's figures before he came home and said, well, how is he going to transform it? Where is he at compared to where he was? And actually, you know, from day one, he kicked off. And Stephen Bradley has played with him, seems to think that he will very much suit the style of their team and what they need. So I don't know what you think, JD, but it's a significant addition. I don't know if you can say with certainty, well, this is the final piece of the jigsaw. I think there's a, there's a hell of a long road to go before you can sort of make a statement like that, I think, anyway. Yeah, no, I'm not. You, you can't say anything with certainty, but it's, it's definitely is an interesting signing. And, and I know from playing against him before, he's a right good player. Like, he is a very good player. Uh, Gerald Morrissey lived with him when he was over in, was it Cambridge they were at together, mm. I think? And he was very impressed with how talented he was, too. I used to keep in touch with Gerald when he was over there, too. So, um, if he comes home and if he does take off, it'll be a massive addition. And, like, it, it, it could be that last little push that they need to get over I'm getting a slight vibe off you, though, that you sort of fancy the dog this year, do you? Or. The old dog for uh, the hard road, or yes, yeah. yeah, so something like that. Maybe look, um, it was probably something that I that I thought last year. Uh, it was a similar question last year where mm. Rovers were Rovers were progressing and looked like the chief threat to Dundalk. And I just thought last year that in the big games, in the league or whatever, that Dundalk would have a little bit too much for them. Um, I I kind of think that again this year, but I think this signing I think this signing is massive, and I think. The first three games have been a bit of a statement from Rovers as well as to, mm. as to how far they've come. And as I was saying earlier as well, the cup final could be a real galvanising thing for them. Just to give them that confidence that they can get over the line, you know. Mm. Uh, it is um, a, a kind of a, a game of a statement of intent potential for Rovers. And Dan, there could be a hell of a crowd in Tallow rather when you think about it. Um, so much at stake, albeit early in the season. And being a bit of shadow boxing as well in terms of... I know of there the, will be, like we talked about that earlier. Like mm. it's, 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 you know... I. I well, you have a history of actually doing it, but I don't think anyone's going to come away and make definitive statements about the title well, after this game. But they're missing a lot of players at the moment, which they're is missing, They're missing five. I mean, they're mm. missing Mountney, uh, Georgie Kelly, Murray, McElhenney, McElhenney, Murray, and I think there's a fifth one as well. But the, you know, it's all... Kol Kolovich as well. Yeah, uh, Kolovich has to come mm. in, sorry. Yeah, so all around the midfield area now, I think McElhenney and, and Georgie Kelly are very close. Mountney and Murray maybe not as close. And Kolovich is a bit of an unknown. Like he, He's a sort of a right-sided... It seems to be a player who plays on the right of a sort of a front three, uh, and we don't know. He has to get his clearance, and it looks like he's very close. I mean, the dog tried to sign Troy Parrott in the that was uh, a hell of a story. unknown, which says something about their, you know, at least the, the confidence that they have. If not, it was possibly unrealistic to think they could get. Finney done. Perth went off on one in the program notes as well. I saw he you, was you, having uh, a bit of a pop he, he at, a, pop at uh, several people. He, well, he had a pop at a pundit who said that they were uh, they were aging as a team. Now I don't know. I've if I was to price Any it up, who that I, was? I, th I think Shane Supple would be the short odds on okay. favour. And I actually thought you were a contender as well. It was something you could say, but I think it might have been Supple. But well, the other this one, is also the fellow that says Liverpool aren't that good a team. Well, this is actually very Liverpool true. Are, and Eric Cantona was overrated. overrated. It was his other Liverpool one. Are yeah, overrated. But, um, Absolutely. Uh, but he, he hated Eric Cantona as a child in the two. <sighs> yeah, the opinion I and the uh, statement are unrelated. Um, and then the other one was he had a go at a he had a go at an agent with a national newspaper column who was unhappy with him over something. Now I don't know if it's related. Did you see as well? Pat Dolan gave us big praise in the <laughs> yeah. paper last well, Pat, week. Well, Pat Dolan was, I think, was critical, right. critical of Vinny in his uh, pre-season piece. What did uh, he say? I think he spoke about the number of interviews he's done, and uh, you know, Vinny seems to be enjoying the award circuit and and something along those lines. Very it was, harsh, it, was, it was a it was a dig of some description. So I think it's fairly clear that he was we're, they were in the firing. We're running out of time. Rovers Dundalk. Uh, give us. You're looking for predictions all us, the time. Give us some sort of idea of what's going to happen. It's going to, it's going to, you reckon it'll be cagey? Well, I think it, there's, there's a chance it will be. Um, but at the same time, I hope it's like a, it's more cagey, but there's actually 
good midfield playing the game rather. I, mean, I don't think they're, they're suddenly just going to start lumping it. You know, I don't think it's going to be like that. But I think you know you might see, and you go back to the criticism of. Uh, that some of them dog players met at Rovers after the cup final that they play some nice football pretty. and it doesn't really go anywhere um, and like that's it's a bit harsh but at the same time you can see how that could happen in a game like this where I think actually this and dog team they're actually happy enough to sort of at times maybe absorb a small bit of pressure and then all of a sudden play Duffy or use someone who can actually you mm. know hit them hit them on the counter because Rovers will have a lot of the ball there's no doubt that they, yeah. they will and the game in Tala last year in June which is probably as well as they've played against them and lost and they lost and and there, there was something in that game which is which was which sort of summed up their battle and it's you know they, they got the penalties in the cup final right and that's that changes the whole story of the day but at the same time they were one nil up until Duffy banged in the goal in injury yeah. time and they couldn't shake them off so there's two ways of looking at that in terms Absolutely. of do, do, do converting those penalty kicks completely change the dynamic between the teams and Chris Shields didn't play in that game either so there is there is other factors there that make you think that actually in a weird way the Stundalk team might be slightly underestimated which just seems an absurd thing to say but I, I think people are, are expecting the changing of the guard before it might actually happen Cheltenham nap before you go uh, that's in the Coral Cup interesting do you have one Dan? Nah, not really at the moment. At the moment, you see, need to look at the handicaps. See what happens. Maybe, maybe a steering for launch to start it off. Very interesting. You give us one there that we can avoid, will you? Solo in the triumph. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks, William, for coming in. Great to see you again. Thanks, lads. Good to have you. Mm. Uh, I can't wait to go to Tal at the weekend. It's going to be an absolute blinder between Galway United and Shamrock Rovers uh, second or whatever they're called on Saturday. Um, but the game on Friday night, we're all looking forward to that. Thanks very much for listening on the podcast and for watching on YouTube. See you next week for episode four.